The Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts, with the support of the gold mining company Paulus, is launching a research project to study a group of objects from Heinrich Schliemann's world-famous Trojan collection. The research project undertaken by the Pushkin Museum is a worldwide scientific event. The research has just begun, and we are looking forward to new discoveries related to the priceless treasure of humanity. We made a discovery. It was assembled incorrectly. Someone, naturally before us, either Schliemann himself or Herbert Schmidt, assembled it wrong. Many films, programs, articles, and books have been written about Schliemann and his findings. We decided to tell you a little about the history of the collection and what Schliemann was looking for and what he found as a result. Schliemann, Schliemann who said he believed in Homer like the Bible, was looking for Homer's Troy, and he found, by destroying a part of this Troy of Homer, an earlier civilization, older by almost 1200 years, 2400 to 2200 BC. It's the period of the Early Bronze Age. We are in Hall 3 of the Pushkin State Museum of Fine Arts, in the hall where the showcases with exhibits from Heinrich Schliemann's excavations, the Trojan Collection, are located. In this hall, a special section, a special unit, has been set aside where a research project called the Gold of Troy is being carried out. What is the essence of the project? This project, which we have been striving for for many years, is only now being implemented because the museum has gained access to two pieces of very important and state-of-the-art equipment. Firstly, a high-resolution microscope, which can magnify objects up to 5,000 times. And the second device, which is not yet in the hall, but the museum already has it, is a spectrometer, which allows us to determine with the highest precision the composition of metal of which ancient objects are made. So, we are in the first phase of our research project, which involves fixing ancient objects from the Schliemann collection. The task is to create a complete picture of the shape and features of these objects with appropriate magnification, times 20, times 30, sometimes times 50, taking the finest measurements, micrometric measurements. So, let's return once again to the fundamental question, which is of great concern to the majority of visitors to this room who are coming to our museum for the first time. From which layer and at what time are the objects from the treasures displayed in our showcases? According to current scientific knowledge, the date of this layer is between 2400 and 2200 BC. Correspondingly, Troy 6 and 7, this monument was located much higher in level in the same hill, and it is almost 1200 years younger. It is a completely different era, a different historical period and a completely different population. There appears to have been no continuity between the population of Troy II and Troy VII. Troy II existed at a time when there was no written language in the region, so no written sources have survived. This period is referred to in science as the Early Bronze Age. Troy VI to VII is also Bronze Age, but the Late Bronze Age, a period much closer to us. And it is precisely the echoes of those events, which were connected with the siege and subsequent destruction of Troy VII, that are preserved by the legend which in oral form reached Homer. Schliemann, who said that he believed Homer to be the Bible, was looking specifically for Troy 7. He didn't know then that it was called Troy 7, a modern scientific notion. He was looking for Homer's Troy, and he found, by destroying part of Homer's Troy, an earlier civilization, older by 1,200 years. 
Ulumenen hemyuri ahai just algeet heken. Pollus dift himus psychas saidi proiapsen. Heroon autus de heloria teo hekionessin. Oi ionoisi te passi, dios de teleie tobule. I have just read the first five lines of the Iliad, and it took about 27 seconds. That is five or six seconds per line. What does that mean for us? It means that for a performance of the entire Iliad, it would take at least 24 hours, or rather more. This means that the performance of this poem took perhaps three or four days, if you consider that it was done all at once, so to speak, in one sitting. All the same, it was impossible to do it in one day or even in two days. But maybe that was not so. Maybe the Iliad was only performed in fragments, and it was performed in its entirety very, very rarely, in exceptional situations. Well, that is probably true for some eras, but it is very important to understand that the Iliad is a complete work. It's easy to demonstrate this if we remember where the Iliad begins. An old man by the name of Chryses comes to the Achaeans to get his daughter, whom the Achaeans had previously kidnapped, Chryseis, who then became a concubine for Agamemnon, the chief leader of the Greeks. And the Iliad ends with another man, Priam, coming to the Achaean camp to retrieve the body of his son Hector, who was killed by Achilles. Thus, it can be seen that the Iliad is a work framed by rage. Twofold fates are bearing me toward the doom of death. If I abide here and war about the city of the Trojans, then lost is my home return, but my renown shall be imperishable. But if I return home to my dear native land, lost then is my glorious renown, yet shall my life long endure. The hero chooses between glory, the Greeks called it Kleos, and return, Nostos. Kleos is imperishable glory, which was associated with immortality, according to the Greeks. It must be said that despite the possible choices, some heroes cannot escape their destiny. They are born to perform heroic deeds. Achilles is one such character. The most famous vast painter of the mid-6th century BC, Exacius, whose name we also know from the signature on the vessels, created an entire cycle dedicated to these two heroes, Achilles and Ajax. They were cousins, sons of Peleus and Telamon, a friend of Hercules, and they were also the greatest of the Achaean warriors. But Achilles was the son of the goddess and always came first, while Ajax had to settle for being second. A famous amphora from the Vatican Museums depict a dialogue between Achilles and Ajax. They lean over a playing board, rearrange their chips, and simultaneously roll dice to see how many steps a chip can be moved. And even in this, in a small game, Achilles wins. He says, Tessera. He gets four points. And Ajax says, Trier, just one point less, one move less. We know that these kinds of games were not just entertainment, but a kind of divination. Which of the heroes will die and gain Cleos, glory, first? Achilles wins. He will die first, but only one step ahead of his cousin. We know that only a few will return home, and some, like Agamemnon, will die at the hands of their loved ones back home. As Guy Hadrian once said, by destroying the Trojans, the Achaeans destroyed themselves. In his famous book, How to Kill a Dragon, 
Culvert Watkins deduces the key basic formula of Indo-European poetics. A man who kills a dragon turns himself into a dragon. There is a later interpretation. He who kills will himself become a victim. And in the Iliad, there is a corresponding quote. Trojans and Achaeans have a share of Eris's battle fury. So, the Homeric question is the question of the authorship of the two poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Who and under what conditions created them? Maybe it was the same person, maybe two people, maybe a huge number of people who each contributed something different to the work, all these works, as they were both being performed over the centuries. What is it, and how was it created, we, at least most scholars agree, know fairly well today. But what are they? The Iliad and the Odyssey are both oral, improvisational epics. So who is Homer? According to the oral theory, he is a narrator or maybe two separate narrators of the Iliad and the Odyssey who made that oral improvisation that was written down. In other words, the person we call Homer was an improviser or two whose works resulted in the creation of these poems, the Iliad and the Odyssey. In a sense, Homer can be compared to modern artists of the spoken word genre, to stand-up comedians or other people who speak before an audience. But there is a very big difference. The thing is that these kinds of stand-up performers rarely seem to improvise. Most of what they perform is a pre-learned written text, and in any case, they have a clear idea of that text. Whereas Homer, as we can be pretty sure, didn't have a notion of a written text. Every time he performed a poem, for example, about the Trojan War or the Travels of Odyssey or any other poem, the poem was born anew and it could differ largely in volume from what had happened in other performances, because to perform a poem for three or four days is very difficult, and probably rarely would there have been good opportunities for it. Most likely in other conditions, Homer, coming for one evening to a village on a market day, would perform the same poem, but in much shorter form, and it would only take two or three hours. Without the efforts of the people who recorded these poems, after this great improviser, of course, nothing could have come down to us. Nothing could have survived. And in a sense, when we say Homer, we have to think of them. Because there were hundreds and even thousands of narrators over the centuries. But the work of only one or two of them has survived. This was due to those who were able to write down these works, to stop the improvisation, to stop the constant rebirth of these stories, and in some special great moment, to capture them in an unchanged form. Schliemann, who tried to find Troy 7 and realized that he had destroyed it, continued excavating and, indeed, dug the layers of both Troy 6 and Troy 7, found objects related to this period, and found a layer of fire, which refers to this time. His work was continued by his pupil and assistant, Derpfeld, a German archaeologist. Later, the American explorer Bliegen dug on the Trojan Hill, followed by a number of scholars, and finally, in the 1990s and early 2000s, Manfred Kaufmann, a professor at the University of Tübingen, and then Professor Ernst Pernicke of the same university, dug there. All of these scholars have made immense contributions to the study of the Hesalic Hill, this unique archaeological site, and have contributed significantly to museum collections and have also solved the question of where Troy was located. Since the hill itself has relatively modest dimensions, about 380 meters in length and 280 meters in cross-section, most of Homer's critics said, where were the thousands and tens of thousands of soldiers who defended it placed in this small fortress? Where could it all have been? None of this is true. It is all a legend. Manfred Kaufmann, as I said, the German researcher, 
professor at the University of Tübingen, during the excavations on the hill and in the plain itself, adjacent to the hill, found the remains of a huge settlement, enormous for those days, about 800 to 900 meters in cross-section. It had an oval shape adjoining the hill, and it is clear that this was the ancient city of Troy in 6 and 7, and Hisalic Hill was its acropolis with palaces, rooms and buildings inhabited by the nobility and the king of this ancient city. On the territory enclosed by a ditch carved in the rock that framed the perimeter of the 800-metre across settlement, there were the remains of ancient houses inhabited by the population of the ancient city of Troy VII. And naturally, thousands of warriors who defended this city could have been stationed there. Thus, the question of the Trojan War pertaining to Troy VII Homer's Troy has been removed. The tradition, the legend preserved to us in Homer's poems are actually real events which genuinely took place in the 12th or early 11th century BC and which are connected with a very serious problem, the so-called Late Bronze Age catastrophe, which entailed a great resettlement of peoples. These are the Sea Peoples. Who are the Sea Peoples? This is the collective designation for the northern tribes who invaded Egypt from the middle of the 14th century until the first decade of the 12th century BC. This designation does not appear in Egyptian texts. It is artificial and was first used by French Egyptologist Emmanuel de Rouget in 1867. The Egyptians themselves called the Sea Peoples as the Northmen, who came from all countries, or the Northern Strangers, who were on their islands amid the Great Green. The Egyptians called the sea in general, whether it was the Mediterranean or the Red Sea, the Great Green. For the first time, the Sea Peoples, or rather individual groups of pirates and mercenaries, are found in the Akhetaten archives. Akhetaten is the capital of the famous pharaoh Enaton, who introduced monotheism to Egypt. In these archives, they are first mentioned as pirates or mercenaries. The real threat to Egypt and the whole eastern Mediterranean was in 1219. We know that in the fifth year of the reign of the son of Ramesses, the great pharaoh Meneptah, the Libyans invaded Egypt under the leadership of their king Moriah. However, the Libyans did not march alone. Side by side with them came mercenaries, five tribes, five northern tribes, which the Egyptians called northerners who came from all countries. We know the names of these five tribes. They are Ekwesh, Tursha, Shekelesh, Shardana and Luka. As early as in the 19th century, these names began to be compared with the ethnonyms known from ancient sources, and it became clear that the main tribes among these northerners were the Ekwesh and Tursha. The Ekwesh are usually compared quite fairly with the Greek Achaeans, and the Tursha are compared either with the Etruscans or with the Trojans because in the Hittite records, the country Taruissa is mentioned, which is usually compared to Troy. Thus we see that a number of peoples mentioned by Homer are found in the Egyptian inscriptions. In a six-hour battle somewhere at Pariah, on the western frontier in the Nile Delta, Meneptah managed to defeat both the Libyans and the Northmen. The Libyans lost over 6,000 men and the Northmen over 2,000. Egypt experienced the next Sea Peoples invasion almost 30 years later. However, during these 30 years, the situation in the eastern Mediterranean grew worse and worse. We know from the Hittite records of enemy ships that plied the expanse of the Mediterranean Sea, constantly threatening the cities of the Levant and Cyprus. Disaster broke out in 1190 BC during the reign of the second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty, Ramesses III. In his burial temple on the west bank of Thebes in Medinet Habu, there is the following inscription. The foreign countries 
made a conspiracy in their islands all at once, the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could stand before their arms. From Hati, Kode, Karchemish, Azawa and al on being cut off at one time. A camp was set up in Amuru. They desolated its people, and its land was like that which has never come into being. They were coming forward towards Egypt, while the flame was prepared before them. Their confederation was the Peleset, Tiaka, Shekelesh, Denyen, and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the land as far as the circuits of the earth, their hearts confident and trusting. Our plans will succeed. Here is what the Egyptian inscription says. And here we see confirmation of this inscription in the Medinet Habu reliefs, which depict the sea and land battles. Ramesses III managed to defeat the invaders somewhere on the borders of Palestine or in southern Syria, as well as to defeat them in a naval battle that took place at the mouth of the Nile. Nila. After their defeat, over time, some of the peoples settled in Palestine and, in fact, the modern name of Palestine is derived from the name of one of the sea peoples, the Peleset or Philistines. What does this have to do with the Trojan War? The fact is that some of these peoples, in particular the Peleset and the Tsyeka tribes, were localized in northwest Anatolia in northwest Asia Minor, that is, in the place where the ancient Troy was located. The inscription of the fifth year, which precedes the 1190 inscription by three years, is very telling. At that time, the Egyptians for the first time encountered the Peleset, Tsyeka and Tursha tribes. They again encountered the Tursha tribe. The inscription says the northern countries, namely Peleset, Tsyeka and Tursha, which were in their isles, were quivering in their bodies. Their land was ravaged. The confirmation of the inscription of the fifth year of the reign of Ramesses III is also found in his inscription of the eighth year, which said that the northern lands were destroyed. Their villages and people turned to ash. Their chiefs went forth to the land of Egypt. Thus we see that we have before us evidence of war somewhere in the regions inhabited by these three tribes. But as late as the 19th century, these three tribes were compared on the one hand with the Tsyeka and on the other hand simply with the Trojans, with the population of Troy and with the Pelasgians. Apparently, one of these encounters is recorded in the cycle of legends about the Trojan War, which, according to Homer, lasted 10 years, the siege lasted 10 years, and then 10 years the return of the heroes from under the ruined Troy to their places of living. These are events are connected to one of the small episodes of the Great Migration for the peoples. The Sea People reached the coast of modern-day Turkey, Syria and Palestine as far as Egypt. They engaged in struggles, battles, naval and land battles with the pharaohs of Egypt and with other rulers they met on their way. They went with their families, with wagons carrying women and children as well. This is a different story. The story related to the migration of the peoples of the sea has nothing to do with the objects on display in this hall. This story is much later, 12th and early 11th century BC. Troy II, the treasures of which are exhibited in our hall, are from 2400 to 2200 BC. This is early Bronze Age. We must honestly say that these things are priceless. They are priceless first and foremost because they are utterly unique items belonging to a unique, discontinued branch of human culture and civilization. They are priceless. Every item is priceless. The research has only just begun. 
Ahead is the main stage, studying the composition of the metals using modern analytical equipment. This will provide a lot of new information about the sources of the metals, which in turn will tell researchers about the links and trade routes in the history of mankind that existed more than 4,000 years ago. Modern technology will help us to uncover the secrets of the Trojan treasures. We will keep you updated regularly about the research, as well as announce interesting new findings. Follow our updates on the museum's website and social media.